from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes. A weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 36, recorded Monday, October 9th, 2006. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Codesmith Tools, makers of Codesmith, an extensible template-based code generator for .NET. Hanselman and its listeners get $100 off Codesmith Professional with coupon code HM100 online at codesmithtools.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine, online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott interviews PowerShell architect Jeffrey Snover. Hey, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is Hansel Minutes. We're doing another unconventional Hansel Minutes this week. I'm up on campus at Redmond. I uh, drove up here for the PowerShell ISV Developers Conference, and I am lucky enough to be sitting in the office of Jeffrey Snover, the PowerShell architect. That is correct? Correct. There's not more than one PowerShell architect? No, there isn't. That's a funny story, though. At Digital, I, I ran into somebody who introduced themselves as the DeckNet architect. I thought, oh, my God, the DeckNet architect, the DeckNet architect. And then a few weeks later, I met another guy, and he introduced himself as the DeckNet architect. And then I discovered that there were 30 or so the DeckNet architects. And so it turned out that, in general, architects have a problem with their... Uh, with their definitive articles there. That sounds like uh, at banks, everyone's a VP. You know, if you've ever met someone at a bank, virtually you know, in the IT department, like everyone is a vice president there you go. at all levels, so that's cool. But in this case, I am the uh, architect. So I've done podcasts on PowerShell before. I did it when it was did one when it was called Monad. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet you at TechEd, and we got to do some uh, talks together. Uh, since then, of course, it's PowerShell, and you just came out with PowerShell RC2, Everyone's loving PowerShell. I'm spreading the word. I love PowerShell. But let's get a little insight into what's kind of going on behind the scenes. Sure. How many people make PowerShell happen? It's not just you. No, we've got a great team. Uh, yeah, I'm always porous with numbers. and but you yeah, know, Ballpark. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's you, there's which like is the architect. So you did yeah. what? The, uh, the overall thing. I came up with the idea. Uh, so it flew out of WMIC. Uh, WMI at the time, we were looking for a you know great value proposition for WMI. And when you write a perf, perf counter, you write a perf counter, you know, see a nice graph, right? Mm -hmm. But with WMIC, you did a whole bunch of work and you didn't see anything for it. So you said, we want to solve that. So we wrote WMIC and it was great, really powerful. And at the time, Bill had been beating me up about .NET. Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill. .NET, so .NET, you were personally .NET. being beaten up by Bill Gates. Yeah. That's cool. You have that kind of <laughs> spoken like someone who has been beat up by Bill. I would love to be beat up by Bill at least once, so I could say that. There you go. Talk to him about diagnostics. So he was beating you up, saying it's not manageable enough. Oh, just saying, uh, you know, that our division we needed to get on .NET. You know, that was the future. Get with the program. And so at the time, I said, okay, you know, I'll go find out what he's talking about here. Investigated it. Thought, oh, you know what? I'll, as a as a kind of science project, I'll take WMIC and I'll rewrite it in .NET. And I was doing that, and I was thinking, also thinking, well, you know, I also want to. Right now, WMIC is dot is a. Uh, you know, coupled to WMI, I could take some of the same concepts and apply them to XML. And so I was going to write an XML shell. And so then, as I got into it, I saw, oh, .NET has reflection. Reflection gives me about 75, 80% of what I get out of WMI. The ability to walk up to some random objects, say, who are you? What properties do you have? What methods do you have? Give me these properties, invoke these methods. So then I realized I could do the same thing I was doing with WMIC against .NET objects, and Bill's out there obviously beating me up to get on the board with .NET. He's going to beat everybody else up. And so I could apply these principles to the mainstream of technology and get awesome power. So that's what happened. So I took that and then found a group who had some funding to do a next generation shell. They were kind of off thinking about doing it in K shell. Or so there was another group. So you're in the, you're in the management an instrumentation group. Yep. You're kind of screwing around. It sounds like you're just kind of doing some prototyping. Yep. Futzing around. Yep. How long did, it, did you, had you learned .NET before? Nope. That so was you my sat first down, time. oh, welcome to .NET. Yep. And how long between that sit down, welcome to .NET, and really getting that reflection could do what you needed to do? It was a couple weeks, or you got it right away? Yeah, it was a week and a half, two weeks, really, really you quick. immediately said, oh, yeah, now I can do something. Yeah, exactly. Once I saw it, you know, once you, when, you, when you see gold, man. Yeah, you just knew it immediately. Yeah. So then this another group that was not your group 
Was he's, doing a next generation shell? No, they, well, no, they weren't after next generation shell. They were just after a better shell, right? So oh. they were going to try and port K shell or or oh, something, wow. just somehow get us a better Anything shell. Anything but DOS. Anything but DOS. And so I went and I talked to them. They said, "Oh, listen, here's what we could do." And honest to God, they looked at me like at a rat's tail hanging out of my mouth. Like, what are you talking about? And so they were kind of intrigued. So they kept coming back and talked to them, talked to them, and they just kind of like, "You're strange." And so I said, "You know what?" come to me in a month and so then i sat down and i just cranked out like fifteen thousand lines of code oh, prototype my. in it and i said now let me show you and then then they're like oh my god you know well can it do this and i'd show them it could do that and they're like well what about this and then they were totally bought in and so then we fired up a, a team to and we ended up having to I left that group, and then they left that group, and we went to a third group to get the funding and make it part of the mainstream OS. So you had you basically had this idea kind of spontaneously, the two of you guys, from pressure from Bill. And how do you just get a group? You have to find some boss who has the power to do that, right? Yep. You, you can't just make a group yourself. Uh, no, that's correct. And okay. so they had some funding, and so we started to use that. And uh, then I worked. Uh, I, I transferred to the Windows Server group. To, they had the biggest uh, need for this, and then over time we eventually moved it, consolidated all underneath Windows Server. So basically, we had a superstar uh, executive, Dave Thomas Thompson, excuse me, who understood the need for this stuff mm. and uh, was a fantastic sponsor. We've had we've had very good luck with executive sponsors. Uh, Bob Moogley has been very helpful in this. Do those guys get it? I mean, sometimes oh, you when know people, that's the greatest thing you know about I mean? Microsoft. Yeah, the execs really get it. You know, I've worked a lot of places, and the great thing about Microsoft is the execs are truly technical, and they get it. I tell you what, you know, you do lots of technical reviews, you sure. know, your peer and this blah blah blah, and you people drill into the to the details of your specs and your architecture. Honest to God, the best ever is Jim Alchin. Really, Jim Alchin. Oh my lord! I mean, he gets he's the me. he's the uh, uh, white haired guy. Looks like uh, who was the guy who did the pictures of? Um, Andy Warhol. <laughs> okay, I don't know about that, but yeah. yeah because I saw him actually working on stage doing, he was doing the coding. He like played yeah. the coding monkey for somebody. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I mean, that's pretty he cool. He's so incredibly uh, perceptive, you know? So we go in with, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they hear the story and they're like, huh? And it takes them like weeks before they finally get it. Jim, we talked to him about it and like in a few minutes, he got to the three core issues and he nailed them, the three most I I insightful questions. And I knew that, because I've been who would deal with them, struggling with them. Yeah, came you up saw with it all right. Solutions. You saw and right through it. Yeah, and all the execs are that way. Steve's that way. Bob's that way. That's and they cool. combine both, you know, strong technical skills. I mean, you got to have your technical act together when you talk to these guys, right? Because yeah. they're going to sniff it out. And they got business skills, strategy skills. They're, wow. Yeah. It's great. So, how close is what you showed them to what you ended up with that we we're going to see? Uh, it's very close. I think the things I think are the biggest differences are originally we had relied heavily on commandlets as being the universal surface for everything. And when it became obvious that that wasn't going to happen uh, in version one, we shifted and supported more native data types, right? Legacy data types, script, you know, XML, sorry, uh, uh, text. So IP config, IP config wasn't it converted in version one. So I needed to be able to take IP config, which outputs text, parse that text and manipulate it, right? So we got great text parsing, regular expression support. Mm. Same thing with com. Uh, a bunch of stuff today is scripted through VBScript and com. So we supported that. Uh, then support for, you know, XML, ADSI, WMI, that was all there. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. And the second thing is that the language is just, you know, far, 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 far richer than I'd, I, I had ever dreamed for. So you your know, language so guy. That's yeah, Bruce guys, Payette? Bruce, Superstar Bruce and okay. Superstar Jim. Jim's a PM okay. and Bruce is the dev lead. Uh, and often there's this, well, who's responsible yeah, for What language? is the difference between that? And, you know, in some place, in some One groups, writes code and one doesn't? Yes, that's true. But Jim writes a lot of code, just we don't let him check it in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in general, uh, these two just work together as a great team to, you know, define what the language should do, right? Jim's got a lot of deep 
uh, Unix background, so he knew a bunch of the things that the Unix guys would want. Uh, and then Bruce is a walking encyclopedia of languages. I mean, you know, we'd come up with some things we wanted to do, and he'd say, oh, you know, some obscure language. You know, Snowball used to try and do that, and here's what that worked well, and here's what didn't work well. These other guys did it this way, and I think we'd be better suited to take their approach. It's like, oh, my Lord. So, and, and you know, Jim, sorry, uh, Bruce is the guy who one day walked in and said, I think we ought to support script blocks. It's like, what? And he explained it, and it's like, oh, my Lord. And it was just transformational experience. I mean, just got an order of magnitude more powerful in Yeah, in overnight. script blocks took me a second. But once you get the idea of the different, the, you know, the scope, how, how much of a boundary that is, that the script block boundary is, uh, and then that there are actual objects themselves, that things can take script blocks as input, you know, self-modifying kind of stuff. You can pass behavior in script blocks as delegates. Yep. Then minds start getting blown. That's pretty advanced stuff, but I've been reading some of these different superstar bloggers of the, the PowerShell bloggers and the stuff they're doing with script, you know, script uh, blocks as delegates. Uh, there was one, one post you guys posted on where you did some kind of uh, – there's a limitation right now on script blocks as delegates, isn't there? They have yeah. to have a certain uh, – Signature. Signature. Yep. But then you guys came up with a workaround by dynamically generating the assembly that contains the appropriate signature – I mean, this, the, the, that was pretty hardcore. That was about the most hardcore thing I'd seen. Done. It was all done in script. Well, the nice thing about it is that's what, what I love the most about PowerShell is the incredible dynamic range. You know, so if you're a beginner out there and you're hearing this, you're saying, whoa, run away, right? Yeah, the answer no, no, is, no, 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 no. we got too deep too fast. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> don't run away. You'll see that it's very easy to get in, just type commands and, and deal with it at an operator level. When you want to start doing scripting, you can kind of do it at like a bash style, which is to say, and by the way, this is an explicit design decision have an incredibly wide dynamic range. So you can go right with very quick ad hoc functions. You don't need to name your parameters or type them. Then you can get more formal name, type, initialize, apply constraints to your variables, that sort of thing. Use different types of scoping, more sophisticated stuff, all the way to systems programming. And the reason for this is, you know, take a look at my bookshelf, right? What you see is lots and lots of different types of books that tools, techniques, right? So there's K-Shell. Uh, I guess at home I've got some on regular expressions and all these utilities. And what happens is that in the Unix world, you know, you have this like toolkit of, of, of tools. And that's great. You know, the toolkit model is a great model, but its downside is that, you know, you have one one tool doesn't really have a particularly large dynamic range. And so you end up having to switch and switch and switch. And each one of the tools kind of do the same things in different ways. So where's the, the synergy? We want to have one tool. Yes, you learn it. And then you can have an incredible dynamic range. Beginners can do beginner stuff and then grow over time to become experts. Experts can do expert stuff. But if they just got a quick ad hoc problem, boom, just type it and they're done. Now, now in Unix, they've got their kind of basic text passing pipeline where you say, uh, you know, I don't know, PS, and it would pass, get all the processes, pipe through said, through awk, and you're moving string from place to place. And it seems like every two-letter combination is some tool, right? You know, it's go XQ, and that's something that's in a bin folder somewhere, you know. Yep. So every two- or three-letter character combination is some widget. And their, their shell experience is the string passing combined with all of these kind of little things. I don't know what they're called, little applets. Yep, utilities. U little utilities. Uh, the, you know, the GNU set of utilities, right? So how did you, how did you keep from putting in the whole kitchen sink You've got a lot of these commandlets, right, which are not executables. There's no get underscore content dot exe floating out there somewhere. It's a different model, right? Right. Yeah. And so what happens is that it looks like a command line, right, that maps to a traditional executable. In fact, what it does is it drives a common parser, right? There's a grammar. These commandlets are, in fact, .NET classes. They present a grammar to the runtime engine. That then parses. We find the correct .NET object. We invoke it. It spits out these other .NET objects, and then you can manipulate those. And because we never rendered a text until you need text, that allows us to be really efficient about the processing of things and uh, the utilities, right? We can write you know, kind of SQL-type utilities against live in-memory objects because you don't render to text until you need to. So you can just get way more powerful um, by basically deferred, deferred uh, rendering. So I can write my own commandlet by making a class and decorating it with some attributes. Yep. Why would I write a commandlet in C Sharp or VB.net 
versus writing a, a script. Yeah. So, you know, we want to get to the point where it's completely the same. You know, it's a lifestyle choice. Um, but right now you can only do about, it depends on how you view it, but about 75% of the things you can do with a commandlet that you can do with a script. So in particular, you can only have one parameter set. So a parameter set is this, like get process, you can start stop process. You can say stop process minus ID blah, or stop process minus name, blah. Those are two parameter sets. With a, with a script, you can only do one. Um, you can also, um, in a commandlet, what you can do is you can put attributes on your parameters for validation, and then PowerShell will do the validation for you. Now, at some point, I always loved this when you know, systems programmers learn this, and they look at these attributes, and they're like, you know what, that, that attribute saves me like three lines of code. You know, I'll just write the... I'll just do write, it as a script. Uh, well, I'll just write the code. This oh. isn't if you're a C-sharp programmer. Oh, right. And we tell them, no, 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 don't write your three lines of code. Use the attribute. Because if you use the attribute, well, if you if you write the code, one of those lines of code is going to be an error message, right? Because you the validation attributes are like, it's got to be one of these four values, or it's got to be greater than five or less than 15, or support this regular expression. So if you write the code to do that, you know, and it doesn't work, you're going to output an error message, which means... You know, when I, when, I, when you have the bell curve of programmers doing the same technique, right. you know, the user is going to get a thousand different error messages for exactly the same mm -hmm. condition. Whereas if you use our attribute, they'll get exactly one. And then we'll translate it into all the languages, right? And so you don't have to do that. So anyway, right now you can't do that with a script, right? You can't say this parameter has these attributes that do validation. Okay. So those things will be common. But so parameter sets today. Parameter and sets, attributes. Attribute-based validation. Yeah. Um, some of the common parameters. So with a commandlet, because it's subclassed off a of base class, our base class has a set of kind of core parameters, oh. which then the engine recognizes. So like error action, if you, if when you write your command, the ubiquitous like, parameters, ubiquitous parameters, one of my favorite words. That's a great, yeah. That's it. I like when I explain it, I go, oh, well, these are ubiquitous, you see. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Everyone has them. Oh, really? They're, ubiqu they're everywhere. You'll find them everywhere. Do you ever read The Ubiquitous Atom? No, no. Oh, one of my favorite uh, early, you know, kid growing up, learn, get, get totally turned on about science, The Ubiquitous Atom. And I've been turned on to the term Ubiquitous. Like Sagan or something? No, I don't know. Some, Is this one of the... No, real scientist. I don't oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember who. Um yeah, so and you don't get those with a with a script, but we're gonna get it. We're gonna make them full uh, peers in the future. Is there a is there a pattern or is there prescriptive guidance on taking existing libraries and deciding how to kind of shoehorn them into being appropriate commandlets? Because I know there's a lot yep. of constraints around what a commandlet ought to look like, what it ought to behave like. A lot of decisions need to be made about how it takes input, what kinds of things it takes as input. Um, and it's not necessarily, and because it's a member of a pipeline, because a, because in an A pipe B pipe C situation, you might be writing B. Uh, I think more thought in the design has to go into it, in my opinion, than Absolutely. as if you were writing just some data access layer, some DAO. Yep, exactly. And in fact, so here I'd, I'd actually take the question. And, and the question is, so if I have this library, how do I expose this commandlet? And I'd say that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Ouch. Right? Yeah. You got it wrong. <laughs> Smack. <laughs> no, and particularly, I mean, that's the whole point of it, is what you want to do is to start with the user. And you think about that mm. poor guy sitting there trying to get his job done and say, what does that guy need? Right? What functions does he need when he's sitting there? Right? And then think in terms of a set of tasks. Right? What tasks is he going to perform? What's he going to want to type? What's he going to want to get, process, and pipe into other things? And then build that. Right? And then take whatever you have, whatever random surface you, you might have generated, and expose it to them. Right? Because the, the things you surface to a developer are different in both type and granularity than the things you're going to surface to the admin, or maybe. And so the key is to think through what does the admin want and surface that. You know, it was interesting. We had always thought that the idea would be that uh, people would write uh, their commandlets, write their .NET libraries, and then commandlets would be a really thin layer on top of those. Uh, but we were shocked, actually, to find that uh, groups like Exchange, what they're doing is they're, they're actually doing that, but they're keeping their .NET libraries private, internal, and they're only surfacing their .NET, uh, their commandlets. And the reason for that is the commandlets then define their well-defined you know, uh, uh, interface to all their functions. It is their remoting surface. It's the surface that can be logged, uh, uh, et cetera. 
So, so using Exchange and as, as kind of the canonical example for those that might want to go and write these kind of things. Yep. If I go and Exchange in the new Exchange 2007, I say get user s Hanselman pipe move mailbox. I'm piping the user through the move mailbox, so then move mailbox knows who I'm talking about because yep. there's this Im- implied. You know, this it's not really implied; it's pretty explicit actually. Uh, users being piped through. Uh, that user object, that's kind of the, 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 the noun. That's the domain object. This is a, you just said that the user experience is important, but it seems like this, it's a little service oriented architecture just on a command line exactly. as you're moving data from service to service with very explicit boundaries. Uh, that user object that they're piping through, is that unique to the PowerShell implementation in the sense of they've designed this noun called user or mailbox and it's only used in the context of commandlets? Or might it be used in some larger DAL or document object model that they've designed? Yeah, no, it could be used in larger document, uh, in larger context. So the way these things work is, this is a great uh, discussion about is a versus has a coupling models, okay? An is a coupling model says, oh, I'm a command and I take a system.diagnostics.process, right? Uh, and you got to be one of those things and I'll take you, well, that then limits you to the, that allows you to then integrate with anything that produces one of those things, right? Cardinality X. But if instead you said, well, no, you know, I, I can take that or I can take anything which has one of those things or which has a process ID name. Because if you give me the process ID name, I know how to take the, or the process ID. I know how to take the process ID and create one of those things. So that's a has a model. And all of a sudden you can integrate with a ton of things, right? CSV files that has a, a field that has an ID or an a CS, sorry, CSV or XML or WMI, whatever. As long as it has an attribute named ID that you can then take, use as a lookup to the real object and then operate on, you can integrate with a ton more things. And so PowerShell supports both models and it's actually actually one of the roles for these parameter sets. If you take a look at stop process and drill into it, one parameter set says, hey, you can pipeline the process object to me. The other one says, hey, you can pipeline the process IDs to me. And so that's what, how you get this like mind-boggling integration possibilities where you know kind of almost anything can talk to anything. Because underneath the covers, I don't know if you've figured this out yet, but underneath the covers, it looks like a traditional, you know, your dad's command line, but it's not at all. What we're doing is we're taking that thing and we're turning it into an execution plan against a generalized object flow engine, right? So you heard of data flows? Well, this is an object flow engine. You give the object to one part of the control, you run the control and until it admits another object, that then controls the sequencing of the next element of the program. So who, if I'm passing into stop process using that example, I could go and say, get process, uh, outlook, pipe, stop process, and it'll get the process object handed to it. Or I could say stop process dash, you know, PID equals, and then the you know, PID and the number. Who handles the getting of the process you're saying that you could pass the actual process or something with a little less fidelity, yeah. but a unique enough thing that I could do the resolution. Yeah, and then the command Who does the re- resolution? The command does. The command Actually, does. there's two answers to that. Because it would be nice if someone would get that for me. Sure, sure. There's actually two answers to that. First is, um, it, yeah. So one is, what we do, literally, is we take a look at the object in the pipeline, and we say, does the, is there something that accepts it by type? And we say, try and bind it. If it works, we go. Then if not, we say, is there something that binds it by name? And we take a look at the name. Oh, it takes ID. And we look at the current object and we say, does it have an ID? And then we say, yes, it does. So, okay, then I'm going to bind it. And what we do is we take it and we see what is the type. So this thing takes it, it takes an integer, but if this has a string, we'll do the coercion to that. Right. Also, the naming is more important than the type. The naming is more important when the in the has a model. So the point there is, if you had said, well, basically, then we we have a number of ways to do this big data coercion stuff, right? So you know, we use the .NET conversion libraries. So you could type converter stuff. Type converter stuff, right? So you could say, hey, I'm going to bind to things whose type is process ID, and we'll take and we see, well, I have this integer, and I don't have a process ID. If you've registered. A, pr- a converter from integers to process IDs, that will just work. That's exactly what my next question was going to be. You nailed it. So my in my command that I would write, I was just thinking, like, well, I'm going to have my, my do it method, and my do it's going to want processes, and my do it's not going to want to worry about how to get from 
foos to processes or IDs or strings or whatever. I just want to process handle it. Yep. You're saying I can go and register type converters using this type converter stuff that I already know how to do because yep. it's built into .NET. Yep. And I'll take as many types as you can throw at me, and you'll say, oh, is there a type converter registered? Convert it. And in that conversion, I could do a lookup a database or a WMI call or whatever. Exactly correct. Right. And so you could say, well, you know, I, uh, I produce type foos. You can go and write foo to process converter, foo to this converter, foo to that converter. And and you, and then people will be able to take your stuff and pipeline it to a wide set of things. And that wouldn't be, it would be okay in, in, in that instance to, to go somewhere to answer that question? I mean, because converting something isn't necessarily always coercion. It may be lookup. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Totally However cool. you implement your converter is fine. That's hot. Yeah. No, that's a, that's the whole goal. That's the idea of this object flow engine, right? A lot of pain in the ass programming stuff is this impedance mismatch stuff, right? This guy outputs something, and they got to get it exactly right to this guy. And the answer is, boy, that's a big pain in the butt, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like programming with surgical knives, right? Well, we want to be able to, like, program with artillery, Right. You know, just kind of over there is where I wanted to get and you take care of it. <laughs> so talk to me about this PS custom object, PS object thing that that if if, if I have a um, uh, if I have a foo object and, and, and the, the listeners are, you know, dot net programmers. So they think about things in terms of CLR types. Right. Yeah. So I've got a foo CLR type. I can pipe it into something uh, and maybe on the way there. uh I don't know, can't really think of a good example, but I lost that CLR type. But you can still process a foo, even though you've never seen one, even though maybe the assembly's gone. Yeah. How does that work? Why would that be useful? Yeah. So what we do is um, we wrap uh, uh, all the .NET objects in an adapter object we call PS object. Okay. And then the PS object then ad adapts different types. So here's a basic issue is that various technology teams have taken and implemented their own type system within .NET. Right. So WMI, WMI has implemented their own type system within .NET. What's that mean? There's, I don't know what, half a dozen WMI classes, but they actually represent, you know, tens of thousands of WMI types. Right. Uh, so, you know, WMI object. Well, in WMI object, it has a property WMI type, and that can take any one of 10,000 fields. Well, and then, and then you say, well, what are your properties? And they all say, well, I have two properties, system properties and object properties. And it's like, well, you know, how's that helpful? And the answer is there's good reasons for it, blah, blah, blah. I'll let them explain to you why those are good reasons. But to you trying to just program, it's a pain in the butt. So we adapt it. And so in our world, when you say, oh, I have this WMI object, I say, well, what are its properties? We'll reach into those property bags and show you them. So basically what we're trying to, and we do the same thing with XML, ADO. So everything ADSI. has this facade. Yes. Everything has this facade. And then for most things, like .NET objects, it's a very thin facade. Just quick, go adapt it. We provide the facade there so that uh, you can add extensions to the .NET object. So, for instance, processes. Uh, you know, .NET is a very regular surface, but not really regular in as as up to the standards of a management technology, right? So specifically, WMI got it right. Everything's called name. Everything's got a name property. Whereas in .NET, you know, some things have name, process has process name, service has service name. Well, why is that helpful? And what we'd allow you to do is to have these type extensions. So you can say process, I've got a new property. It's called name. It maps to process name. Service, got a new property. It's called name. Have you included some of those by yeah, default? Yeah, absolutely. So you've actually modified the base class library by spot welding on additional stuff where you didn't like what they did. Exactly. Yeah. So this To is make good, it more regular. To make it more regular, right. This is this whole theme of like the democratization of types. Look, you know, you got a job to do and these guys, their role is to help you do their job. And to the degree to which they do it, great. And to which the degree to the degree to which they don't do it, then get the hell out of the way and let some people in there who can help you get your job done. That's what our type system is about, right? If they've met your needs, fine. We're very thin layer access directly. But if they haven't met your needs, we've extended and wrapped it in such a way that we, you, third parties can go and make it meet your needs. Wow. That's hot. There you go. Uh, the last question I want to ask you is about the, the hosting stuff. Uh, you know, if you type get host, get hyphen host, you see that even, even the UI is, is, is a facade. I mean, everything is abstracted away. Everything can be swapped out. And already we've seen things like Carl Prosser's PowerShell analyzer, like SQL analyzer for PowerShell. You know, it's a complete, he doesn't want to call it an IDE, but it's, it's, and it's an environment for developing PowerShell, but it's a complete host. Yep. It's hosting PowerShell. 
What other kind of instances do you think people are going to start using? I've seen those couple. What other reasons might I want to go and write a host for PowerShell? Yeah, so basically anytime you want a, um, uh, uh, well, just a, a computing engine, right? So, or a, like how's a really that different from a run hybrid. space? Oh, uh, oh okay. Saying? Because I've, gotcha. you've been saying that we want to do um, MMC, right? So I'll go and I'll write my whole, like at Carillion, we do banking. So I'll write a whole financial institution management system entirely in PowerShell. Yep. And now it's time to do it in MMC. Yep. How do I call those those command lines? How do I reuse my pipelines? Am I just building command lines and calling run spaces? And how how is hosting a run space different than becoming a host? Gotcha. Okay. So indeed, uh, you know, in this regard, I don't know if you ever use Tickle. But I was very inspired by Tickle and wanted to emulate the great characteristics of Tickle. The great characteristic of Tickle was they had a Tickle shell, an interactive shell, but it could also be loaded into your li into as a library into your application. And then loaded into your library during the initialization, you could go and say, hey, here, I want to add my, my, uh, 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 extensions. So then all of a sudden, in that instance of the, the uh, engine, you could run scripts which uh, performed actions against your application's objects. So you can automatically macro enable your application and just by including their library and calling it. Exactly. So that was the inspiration for this. And so what we did was we went a little bit farther and we said instead of it being a library, we t chose the ADO model, right? The conceptual model of, ha and we called them run spaces. And the idea was I'd like to connect to a run space. And that's going to be a script execution space. And I'd like it to be here or there or there. I'd like to have five of them or 10 of them, whatever. In the future, you'll see that you'll be able to say, I'd like to be full ADO type Molly. Say, I'd like to have a run space on that machine with these credentials and that machine and those credentials. Set up these parameters and then send some scripts there, some scripts there, get the output, merge them, etc. Then... The, the issue is now when I run these scripts, at some point they might require information from the user, read host or write host. So if in order to that to work, we have this virtualized host interface, which basically has a set of interfaces that you uh, support, read host, write host, things like that. And then you get to implement them however you want. So Exchange went, wrote an MMC snap-in, they're a DLL. Right into MMC, right. they load our DLL, which then creates a number of run spaces. They why a number? Oh, um, so when you do a, a, a well, when you send a, a command on a run space, uh, it blocks. It's basically the very you know the kind of early ADO model sure. where you can run one at a time. Okay, it's exactly the so same. I need model. to maintain my own run space pool. That's what they did. Okay. Yep. Um, and so they have, and so if you do something that's going to take a while, you run it on that one, and then you have something else, you run it on another one, get the results, and use them. And then they've got a, a host interface for things like, you know, when you do write progress, they actually bring up, you know, Win32 dialog box with the progress indicator. So you, you, we're we're here at the at the PowerShell Developers Conference, and there's going to be some talks later this afternoon on how to integrate with MMC. Yep. What kind of helper helper libraries do you have that are PowerShell specific and MMC specific to make or, or best practices to make this easier? Or do we just go and make a snap in and start calling run spaces? What are the what are the best practices? No, that's essentially it. You make a run space and start invoking it. Okay. Uh, you know, we have lots of content on how to do that today. Do we have to write the host ourselves to handle things like write progress and the different progress bar interactions? Sadly, yes, you do. Okay. Yeah. Over time, you'll see more and more of that integrated directly into the system. But for now, that's what you do. So then at some point in the future, then maybe writing a PowerShell MMC snap in would be you know, file new Power MMC, PowerShell MMC snap-in thing, and I'd get some of that, that available to us? Uh, watch that space. Oh. Or here's the other way to do this. I learned this trick when I used to work for Tivoli. Think about it this way. What would a smart person do? Fantastic. You can that's assume that's what we're going to do. <laughs> that's exactly what I like to hear, and that's a good place to end. Thank you very much for being on Handsome Minutes. I really appreciate your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you.